Love it how it gets so quiet right before we start. <laughs> okay, it is 10 o'clock. Uh, looks like we've got a great crowd here. Uh, really happy to see everyone here for our board meeting that we get to do on our Bryan campus. We've got some really exciting things to discuss about things that are happening here. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, mm -hmm. The Texas Government Code permits this Board of Trustees to meet in a closed executive session for the following reasons, among others, to consult with the college district's attorneys on matters deemed privileged by the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct, or Government Code 551.071, to deliberate regarding real property under 551.072, a prospective gift under 551.073, certain personnel matters under 551.074, security devices or security audits under 551.076, and economic development negotiations under 551.087. If the board meets in a closed session, we will announce the particular section under which we, are, we will be doing so prior to initiating the closed portion of the meeting. So, uh, Moving on to item two on the agenda, invocation and pledge to the American and Texas flags. We've got two of our students, uh, Mr. Ethan Baker, freshman from Spring Branch, Texas, majoring in business. He's gonna transfer to Relis next semester. And uh, Luis Hernandez, freshman from Fresno, California, majoring in liberal arts. Thanks guys for being here. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Lord, Please bless the Chancellor and the Board of Trustees as we be begin a new semester. Watch over the student, faculty, and staff as they come back to campus. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, looks like we've got one individual signed up for public comment. I'd ask her to come forward, uh, Miss Melissa Meek. No? No, that's not for public comment. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on, we will go to item four on our agenda, the report section. Uh, the first um, 
item is the Chancellor's Administrative Report. Dr. Hensley. Thank you, Chair Kolkhorst, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to the beginning of a wonderful spring semester. I hope each of you had a wonderful winter break and also a very special Martin Luther King's Day yesterday. It's my pleasure to welcome our trustees back to the Bryan campus, and we look forward to sharing reports with you today that showcase just a few of the exciting initiatives taking place here in Bryan, including our veterinary technology program and plans for the new Bryan campus administration building. Trustees, let me start with a new item, a mobile nursing unit. Trustees, the Division of Health Sciences recently was awarded a $425,000 grant for this mobile nursing unit. They are smaller versions of the simulation labs we have at the Brenham Campus Science, Technology, Engineering, and Innovation Building, and also at the Rellis Academic Alliance. Placed inside a bus, this mobile unit will allow Blend to provide students our state-of-the-art hands-on simulation experience, but they're off campus. We anticipate that the mobile nursing unit will be ready by this coming July. Upon its arrival, it will be used for clinical training experiences and the recruitment of nursing students to blend. Additionally, it will allow us to place more students into preceptorships and expand our nursing student capacity. I'd particularly like to congratulate and ask them to stand if they're in the audience today as I call their name, Vice Chancellor for Applied Sciences, Workforce and Economic Development, Jay Anderson. Dean of Health Sciences, Michelle Jubenstein, Associate Degree Nursing Program Director, Carla Ross, and Simulations Director, Sammy Rahman. Congratulations to you. Thank you so much for your successful application. And of course, trustees, I would have to add that this just adds one more kudo to our nationally and state recognized program for nursing. Thank you for all you do in your leadership. We appreciate it so much. Well, now I'd like to go to another grant, and um, this one also is in Jay Anderson's area. We recently received a grant related to workforce training. Now, this grant is in partnership with the Brazos Valley Workforce Solutions and five local electrical companies. Blinn was awarded a $300,000 grant to provide pre-apprenticeship electrical uh, technician training to approximately 200 students. That training, which begins at the end of January, includes adult education and literacy tutoring for students undergoing the training. Algebra often proves to be a barrier for prospective electrical apprenticeships. And through this program, we look forward to helping our community meet the high demand for electrical professionals. Uh, also, another kudo for uh, Jay Anderson and his wonderful group. Blends Corporate College within the Division of Technical and Community Education recently secured a closed grant to provide training for a new business opening in Sealy. Hendricks Industries is opening a new quartz manufacturing plant in Sealy that will produce quartz countertops and tile. As the first and only quartz manufacturing plant in Texas, Hendrix Industries will hire approximately 200 employees and has contracted with Blend to provide onboarding for their new employees. This training begins at the end of January also and will include OSHA 10 safety training, rigging, forklift training, and workplace violence prevention. And now for another first at Blend on Friday, we hosted the inaugural Rellis Academic Alliance Town Hall at the Blinn Rellis Administration Building. For the first time in the history of the Rellis campus, this event brought together faculty and staff from Blinn College and each of the partner universities that make up the Academic Alliance. There are 11 of them. This event included remarks from Rellis Campus Director Kelly Templin, Texas A&M University System Associate Vice Chancellor and Provost of the Rellis Academic Alliance, Dr. Nancy Shankel, Texas A&M System Associate Vice Chancellor and Director of the Rellis Academic Alliance, Dr. James Nelson, Blends Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Dr. Marcelo Busicki, 
and Blinch, Vice Chancellor for Academic, excuse me, for Student Services, Dr. Becky McBride, who had an awful lot, I must acknowledge, to putting this together for us all. Thank you very much for all of your leadership. And this provided an opportunity, as you can see on the screen, to once again use that very hotly required and asked for a meeting room at the top of the Rellis building. And it provided an opportunity to continue to strengthen our bonds between our partner universities at Rellis. So congratulations, Marcelo and Becky and everyone that put this first ever event together. We really appreciate it. Well, trustees, today we are joined by another group. We are joined today by Dr. Elmer Godney, Academic Dean for the Division of Natural and Physical Sciences to discuss one of the exciting programs offered here on the Bryan campus, the Veterinary Technology Program. Dr. Godney is accompanied by Program Director Jessica Garza and Clinical Coordinator Heather Kennedy. Through this program, students have two tracks to their Associate of Applied Science degree in Veterinary Technology a two-year face-to-face option, and a three-year blended track in which some courses are completed online. Thanks to the quality of our program and its location here in Bryan College Station, Blinn is the only community college that has an agreement in place with Texas A&M University to complete its veterinary technology laboratory and clinicals at the Texas A&M's world-renowned veterinary medical teaching hospital. Additionally, Blinn's first-time national board examination pass rate ranks number one in the state of Texas. At this time, I would very much like to um, have you welcome Dr. Godney and his team to the floor, and they are going to speak to you and make a presentation at this time. Dr. Godney, thank you for your wonderful program and for your great leadership. Mr. Colcourse, Dr. Hensley, Board of Trustees, I thank you for allowing me to speak to you about what I think is a really exciting program. So how do I get into it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So first of all, I wanted to say, as Dr. Hensley mentioned, I am the Dean of Natural and Physical Sciences, and that makes up the biology, chemistry, geology, and physics departments, and we offer associate degrees in all of those areas. We also offer associate of applied science degrees in biotechnology laboratory sciences and veterinary technology, as well as certificates in biotechnology laboratory sciences. Today, as Dr. Hensley mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about veterinary technology. I would like to first introduce Jessica Garza, LVT, who is the director of the program, and uh, Heather Kennedy, LVT, who is the clinical coordinator for the program. And those initials LVT stand for Licensed Veterinary Technologies. Okay, so before I get started, I want to say, what is a veterinary technician or technologist, okay? Because a lot of people don't know what that is. It's more than a vet assistant. A vet assistant is somebody who gets hired by the veterinarian and starts training them in the office. They have no degree. They're just trained right there. And usually they sit at the desk and make appointments. A veterinary technician, you could equate it to a nurse or a physician's assistant for the veterinarian, okay? So they can perform most procedures. The only ones they cannot perform is they cannot diagnose or prognose. They cannot perform surgeries, but they do assist with surgeries, with the anesthesia and so on and so forth. And they cannot prescribe medications, although they do administer medications. So they are like the veterinarian's right-hand person. So the vet tech program started in 2010 at Blinn College, and the first graduating class uh, graduated in 2012 uh, because it's a two-year program. And since then, we've had 11 graduating classes with a total of 105 graduates. We are accredited through the uh, Committee on Veterinary Technician 
Education and Activities, the CVTEA, which is a subsidiary of the American Veterinary Medical Association. So we are accredited through technically through the American Veterinary Medical Association. We have had accreditation since 2012, and our most recent site visit was last June. And I want to say we came through with flying colors. We are fully accredited. And not only that, but normally AVMA sends out the CVTEA every five years for accreditation sites. We have been granted a six year period. So we're in an elite group because they were so impressed with our program. So some of the things that they noted as strengths of the program, we have dedicated personnel who are committed to student success unique opportunities for collaboration with Texas A&M School of Veterinary Medicine, engaged and passionate student body, personnel engaged in professional development and professional organizations, and we utilize multiple teaching models which allow students to perfect their skills in multiple ways. So where is the program? It is in, technically it's in College Station because it is on the uh, Texas A&M uh, campus. We are at the uh, Veterinary Teaching Hospital. We rent space in that building. Uh, we've had a long-standing collaboration with Texas A&M. And in fact, our students have two clinical rotations in the program, and the first one is done at the Texas A&M uh, facilities. And they train alongside the veterinary students. Along with that, their second clinical uh, rotation is performed at various vet clinics throughout the area. And currently we have 39, uh, well, as of last week, we had 39, we now have 40 uh, clinical affiliations uh, throughout the various counties listed there. Most of them are in Brazos County, as you would imagine, but we do have them all over uh, Southeast Texas. So the program, as Dr. Hensley mentioned, we have two forms of the program. We have a two-year program, which is basically a face-to-face -face program. The students come to campus and they take all of their courses, or the vast majority of them, face-to-face. -face. Then two years ago, we started a three-year program, which is we call the blended program. And the students take their didactic lectures, classes online, and then they come to campus in the evenings or weekends or when they can, basically, to uh, do their perform their laboratories and their clinical affiliation or their clinical uh, rotations and so forth to perform all their clinical uh, stuff. Uh, currently, we have four cohorts going through the program. We have the first year and second year face to face classes. And we also have our first and second year blended program classes. Next year, we will have five cohorts because we will add our third year blended program students. So how successful is the program? As Dr. Hensley mentioned, we're very successful with the uh, VTNE passage rate, which is the Veterinary Technician's National Exam. In 2017 and 22, through 2020, uh, our passage rate was 88.46%. And when we talk about passage rate, we're talking about first time taking the test. So 88.46% of, of our students pass it the first time they try. The national average is 73.37. So we are quite a bit higher than the national average. We do not have the data yet for 2021 through 23 because it comes out every three years and it hasn't come out yet for those years. And I will mention that all of our students have a job when they graduate. So it's a very successful program. Okay, the Vet Tech program does a lot of community service, as you can imagine. Uh, they hold, uh, they do spays and neuters at the Bryan Animal Shelter, which also helps us out because then the students can assist in those surgeries as well. And then we have a very active student chapter of the National Association of Veterinary Technicians in America, or the NAVTA. The student chapter is very involved. They hold uh, clinics where they give free microchips and nail trims to pets. Uh, we have rabies clinics. 
Uh, they participate at the Brazos Valley Fair and Rodeo where they check paperwork for all of the animals to make sure that it's all up to date and uh, what's needed. They participate at uh, Wienerspiel and the Christmas parades and career fairs, as well as outreach at local schools. Now, if you notice the picture there, I have of the float that they had in this year's Christmas parade. Uh, I will mention that this float, they got first prize in the division, third prize overall, and they also got a green award for using recycled materials and uh, models and stuff like that that we have in the program. So they were very successful in this year's parade. And with that, I'm gonna ask you, do you have any questions? Dr. Gallin, it sounds like a great program. Um, what is the salary range that these students, when, when they come out of our program, kind of what, what will a student be able to make any idea? Okay. Yes. So usually starting rate is anywhere from about thirty to forty thousand, just for your basic small animal practice. That can increase if they go into specialty hospitals such as Houston, Austin. They have specialty um, or research also gives a lot closer to forty to fifty thousand. Um, but starting out, usually about fifteen dollars an hour. How do we recruit these kids? I mean, how do we let them know about this program? Yes, so we're going all over the place, I feel like. So I'm really trying to outreach a lot of high schools. I feel like that's a big place that we go. So we have some high schools tour our facilities, um, kind of side by side with A&M, and we give them a tour through all of our labs and show them exactly what we do. We pull out models to kind of show them what they would be doing. We also go to a lot of career fairs as well. And then I also have something set up with the A&M faculty and staff because the blended program was actually set up for those A&M coworkers to get the people that are already working at A&M licensed to become LVTs. So I have a big presentation set up for A&M only to get them started in the blended program. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. How many students are in a cohort in each cohort? In each cohort. Um, we are restricted by accreditation. We can't have more than uh, labs with animals in it. We can't have more than eight students per faculty member. So that limits us to eight, 16, 24. Uh, we try to keep it at that. Uh, right now, uh, the, f the maximum that we enroll is 16 in the face-to-face. -face. And uh, overall, right now, I think we have 32 students between all four cohorts. So is that a competitive entrance? Yes. Okay. Yes. And they go through some type of admissions they criteria. Have to, they fill out the yeah. admissions process uh, application. They also have to shadow at a vet clinic for 40 hours just to make sure that they understand what they're getting into. Uh, and then I believe there's a written essay in that. Yes. And then we interview them as well. And it's only in the last maybe four or five years where we've actually turned students away. Yeah, I know in the past there was a problem getting students. Right. It used to be we had a problem getting them. Now we're that. actually turning them away. And if they're, we only turn the students who we don't think are going away, the students that we don't think are going to make it through the program. But if we have students that we think are very good students that we could get in the program or are iffy, we're going to, we try to lean them towards the blended program so that it's a little bit slower and uh, they can do it in three years rather than two. Any other questions? Does each college district have one of these programs? No. no. That's what I was wondering. Okay. How many are in Texas? 15 or 17. The closest okay. we have to us is Lone Star. They do have a program. Okay. All what right, Dr. Um, Godney, you and your team just do a wonderful job and you, you so do. exemplify how vibrant and exciting it is to teach and to learn at Blim College. So thank you all for being here today and sharing all about the wonderful work that you do. And at this time, Chair Kokhurst, I'll return the podium back to you. Great, thank you so much. 
All right, now we're going to uh, go to uh, Mr. Cervantes for the presentation of financial statement package for the period ending December 31st, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hensley, members of the board. The report that I'm going to give today takes us through the month of December, which would mean we're four months through the fiscal year or 33%. Our revenue through December is $54.1 million. Our expense is 44.3, which leaves us a net just a little bit less than $10 million. When we compare that to the previous year for the same period of time through December, our revenue is at 54.1 this year. Last year we were at 57, uh, $2.9 million less. I will remind the board in uh, fiscal year 22, there's about $7 million worth of uh, federal money uh, that came in that year. Total expenditures uh, this year are $44.3 million compared to 41.9. Uh, so our expenditures are up $2.4 million. Our net change in fund balance is still positive, a little bit less than $10 million. Uh, last year we had 15.2, so $5.3 million less, and again, the $7 million had an impact on that. Our revenue comparison by source, are, the numbers are fairly uh, consistent from this year to last. Auxiliary is up uh, some, tuition and fees are absolutely up. Interest is uh, through the roof up. Uh, we're still getting great rates. And then the, you can see the difference on the far right, the HERF money last year, 13% of our revenue uh, compared to 1%, 1 which has no HERF money in it. Our tuition and fee revenue, uh, the actual versus budget, we budgeted $73.5 million. We are at 34.2. That leaves us a percentage of budget about 47%. Typically, at this juncture through the fall semester, we're looking for the numbers to fall somewhere between 45 and 50 percent. So we're, we're right on right on track. Our tuition revenue uh, compared to last year, $933,000 more, 5% uh, increase. Out of district is the biggest uh, increase, 826, uh, 827,000. But out of state is also up $716,000. Our fee revenue uh, is also up 8%, $1.1 million. General fee is the largest part of that, $836,000. But lab course fees are also up as well as the workforce non-credit fee. Our housing and food service revenue, the actual compared to budget, we budgeted $10.8 million. We're at $4.5 million. 42%, a little bit less than what we would like it to be. But on the other hand, we did have some, uh, uh, some changes that were made this year. So you see housing on the far left, that's the one that I was referring to, uh, 2 million, a little bit, uh, 2 million, a little bit over $2 million last year. We had a little bit more, but we took three, three facilities offline. Our food service is up, uh, compared to last year and the bookstore is up compared to last year uh, generally leaving us a total about 797 796,000 or 15 percent up compared to last year in in auxiliaries our total expenses are up 2.4 million dollars total salaries and benefits uh 1.5 of that 2.4 is there and then the eng expenses another million dollars our allocation of each revenue dollar, uh, I did want to point out to the board something that we're, we're keeping an eye on. You can see the trends pretty much on all of these, but you can see the, the payroll expense uh, continues to go up, but so do all the others. The maintenance, especially if you're looking at it compared to 2019, maintenance is up as a percentage, travel is up as a percentage of the revenue, services are up, consumables are up, utilities are up. And when you go to the next page, you see some of the same thing, except for facilities rental, which we're doing less of. 
uh, was the big big change and then we didn't we didn't have any r and r budgeted this year is why that is so here's where i'm going and where i'm leading to we have a i asked uh, the staff to prepare this percentage of total expenditures to total revenue through the month of december it's a efficiency ratio so it's basically calculating the burn rate that we're having of the revenue that's coming in through the month of December. If you look at the far uh, right, our burn rate is at 82% compared to uh, the previous years that were uh, in the lower 70s. We're going to keep an eye on this. I don't know that we have enough information at this juncture to be able to make any, any specific uh, suggestions here. Uh, but there is an impact, there is some concern that we're spending more at a faster rate than what we have in, in previous years. Our expense comparison by category is up $2.4 million, the 6%. The bulk of that is salaries is the big part, and then also the ENG expenditures, as we suggested, even though the percentage there is less than what we had uh, uh, last year. Our operating expense comparison by function is $2.5 million or 7%. So our student cash and refunds in December were $4.3 million. Our student payments on the right, we received $4.7 million, but on the left, we issued refunds at $425,000. Our other cash receipts in December, uh, state appropriations on the bottom is the large part, largest part of that $3.2 million. It's 2.6. Uh, we receive, continue to receive some insurance proceeds on the left and on the far right, the $239,000. And interest, as I said, uh, keeps growing. Our use of cash in December was $8.4 million. Construction, uh, $623,000. And accounts payable, $1.5 our payroll is $6.3 million is the largest portion of it. In summary, our increase in unrestricted cash, or actually decrease in unrestricted cash, net cash received from students is $4.3 million. The cash received from other sources is 3.2. Our use of cash was $8.4 million, so it declined by a little bit over a million dollars, and we took that from our, our bank. Our unrestricted cash and cash equivalents uh, through the month of December showed $126.6 million. Last year, by way of reference, uh, we were a little bit higher, $133.1 million. That concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. And I'll stand for any questions. Just a quick question on the bookstore. Um, I was curious about the huge increase in bookstore revenue compared to last year. I know we were talking about the bookstore a little bit, about changing kind of the way. Did that already have an impact on that or? There were, there were uh, it's just part of my uh, maneuvering, I guess, to make sure that our budget in this fiscal year, because we were gonna be without the HERF money, I wanted to have as much revenue as I could get into this, this year. So when we concluded our contract with Barnes and Noble, uh, last year around June, uh, I asked or included in the contract that the uh, the money, the commissions that we receive as a bonus, signing bonus, would be extended into the new fiscal year, which is this year. We also have uh, the first day complete, uh, also had a, a signing bonus, the one that the board approved in, in December. That also will be coming this year, will be in this year's uh, revenue too, but coming as soon as I can get it in here, that'll be the next step. Real quick, the burnout or eighty-one percent is some of that due to the lack of the her funds, or in it probably shows those uh, during uh, probably during the the years where we actually had the her funds, it would have made that number actually lower uh, because there would have been a lot more more revenue, uh, but I I think there's a number of reasons for it. Uh, we haven't delved into it. I know part of it, and maybe the biggest part, or big part of it, I don't know if it's the biggest part, would be the notion that we're paying more debt too. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have a, we have a higher debt service than what we've had in previous years, so that's a portion of it. I don't know how much of this is timing issues. That's why I'm, we're gonna keep tracking it through the end of the year to see if we can garner exactly what it is and what's, what's happening. At this point, we don't have any, any explanations other than we're seeing the number rise faster mm -hmm. than what we would like it to. Mr. Moser? 
<clears throat> excuse me, you you answered part of it. And I was going to ask about services. That's a that's a very inclusive name. But what are some of the larger specific? You said debt service. I, is that part of the? Uh, Mr. Moser, a payroll is always going to be your largest uh, expenditure. Uh, under the category of services that you outlined up here? It's not services. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm missing something. On the same same uh, graph or the yeah. same slide? Yeah. yeah. Those are our total expenditures, not just service. Total expenditures as a percentage of the gross revenue that we received through through December. So we're spending 81, 81 cents of every dollar that we're bringing in. And in years past, through that same time for December, we were spending in the 70, 70 cents or something. But a biggest, the biggest portion of that, sir, is going to be your, your payroll. Its biggest portion in, is for all schools. Anyone else, any other questions, guys? What I would say is that, you know, on that burn rate, obviously that's something that we need to watch very closely. And I don't know how how quickly you guys think you can do some kind of an analysis to just give us some perspective of if there's an area that we need to, you know, really pay attention to. Sure. But, the you know, I don't know if, it, if our next board meeting you're going to have enough time to actually have taken a look at that. But I'm sure this board will want to know at least within the next couple of months, you know, uh, your opinion on what we need to be looking at. That's reasonable, Mr. Chairman. I, th I think we'll be able to bring that to the board. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, now for uh, a, an exciting part of the program here, the presentation of an update on the administration building on the Blend Bryan campus. Mr. Cervantes, I bet you're going to hand that off. Mr. Chairman, uh, it is a new year, but some things never change. And I, I'm uh, going to hand this off to Mr. Feldhag so he can make the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hensley, uh, members of the board. I'm, I'm excited to be back in front of you today. I've taken a little break the last few months, but I'm, I'm excited to show you the progress of our new Bryan administration building. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. So I think I'm going to jump right in. Uh, Part of this is just going to be a refresher. I'm going to remind the board uh, of our team. So our, our design team on this is Kirksey Architecture. We hired them in November of 21. I've been going through a design and a redesign process. Uh, just to give you guys some perspective, Kirksey Architecture is the same design team that designed the Walter Schwartz building on the Rellis campus, as well as the renovation to our Moody Library on the Brenham campus. And then our construction manager is Vaughn Construction. Uh, we brought them on board in February of 22. Again, they've been working on some pre-construction services and some estimates for us in this, in this interesting climate we have. Uh, and as a reminder of what Vaughn has done for us in the past, they were the contractor for the Schwartz building, as well as the contractor for the STEI building on, on the Brenham campus. So a very successful team in, in the projects we've done with them in the past. Uh, now, getting into our new Bryan administration building, uh, we've talked about this a little bit a couple months ago, but just to bring it back to the forefront, the, the, the purpose of this building is to move the student services functions back from the Tejas Center, bring those back to the Bryan campus uh, on, on Villa Maria, uh, as well as to relocate some administrative functions specifically out of the S building, which is on the far south side of campus, and give those all a new home on the north side of campus, uh, giving the campus kind of a new gateway entry and, and refacing the campus towards the north. Some of the highlighted departments that will be occupying this building uh, are what's shown here. We're gonna have a new student lobby, obviously very necessary for those student services functions. All of the student services functions will be located on the first floor of this two-story building. Uh, also in this, uh, we will have a police and security desk and office so that we have security for the building. Will include financial aid offices, academic advising offices. Uh, this will relocate our testing center. Uh, we'll also include our enrollment services, uh, a transfer office to help our students transfer from our two-year school into four-year schools. Uh, this will bring our registrar into this. Uh, this will bring dual credit offices, uh, as well as prospective student relations, which is currently located on the, the Bryan campus in the A building, but we're gonna combine them with the rest of student services. Uh, this will also bring in the business services office, as well as human resources, administrative offices, uh, as well as a, a needed meeting space uh, 
for uh, the only dedicated meeting space we would have on our largest uh, campus by student enrollment. Now, to give the board a little perspective on, on where we are, uh, just kind of a Bryan area map, there's a lot going on on this map, but it, it really shows you uh, the, the regional area around campus. So I'm just going to kind of highlight a few areas. That, that blue highlighted area you can see, and let's see if the cursor will work for me. The blue highlighted area is Blinn's property. Uh, some of these darker blue are the buildings that we have, uh, and we'll see that a little bit more as we zoom in. Uh, but this darker blue box is the area of development we're looking at with this project. And this includes about a four acre tract of land that we bought a couple years ago and we demolished some buildings just last year. This also shows you the major traffic pathways around campus. So you can see Texas 6, you can see the, the William Joel Bryan Parkway, as well as Villa Maria and 29th Street and Briarcrest. And you can see how this opens up another entryway into campus, this yellow circle of being a new entryway in and out of campus. The green circles indicate the existing uh, entries and exits to campus, uh, which we know whenever we do have a full campus, those can become very congested. So adding another way in and out of campus is going to be very, very beneficial for us. Zooming in again to our, our campus, we're going to zoom in a little bit more. Again, you can see the green circle showing uh, the current access points to campus, including this Red River, uh, which is a right in and right out only. So it's a little bit limited in its access. Uh, but this new yellow circle would be a new development area for the Nash Street. Uh, and Villa Maria intersection bringing students into campus. Uh, you can see the, the P indicate various parking locations, our, our blue area for the main buildings of campus. Uh, and then if you can, there's a, there's a black dashed line that begins to indicate the property boundary. Uh, and I'll highlight this in a, in a future slide, but I do want to indicate that there is a section of land here that Blend does not own. Uh, these are some residences and some small businesses, so this is not land that Blend owns that kind of cuts out some of this area as well as just indicating there's residential community and some light commercial businesses just to the north of our development area. Now diving into the design. I'm gonna jump into the site plan for this design, show you some renderings, and then we'll delve into some of the floor plans uh, before I, I conclude with some other information. So on the site plan, again, I'm just gonna indicate the yellow circle, just to put it in perspective. Um, this is, this is the area just on the north end of campus. We purchased, again, about four acres of property a couple years ago, demolished three structures just last year, uh, and making room for this development. Uh, now, to highlight some of the areas on the site plan, this is the, what's highlighted in the red box is our new building, the, the proposed new Bryan Administration building. It's a 46,000 square foot building total, so that's a 23,000 square foot footprint per floor. It's a two-story building. And we'll get into some of uh, what occupies and how that's laid out uh, shortly. Uh, also adjacent to that, uh, you're, you'll notice the various access drives and parking uh, that are associated with that. Uh, another very important aspect of this project is going to be the extension of Nash Street. And in the previous development, there was an access easement for some of the residential properties to the north. Um, we are going to be working with the city to develop a public roadway in this section uh, to maintain that access to those residents uh, and have a city defined street in that area. And that will also include the development of that intersection uh, to, to make that a good entryway into campus. Also at this intersection, in, in, in development, but a little bit behind the development of the design of the building will be a campus monument sign, our water feature. That design hasn't quite been fully vetted yet and run through, but it will be in, in, in development as we continue on. So there will be a monument sign to kind of announce Blinn's presence at this new entry. We're also proposing a, a circular entry drive, very similar to what we have at the, the Rellis Administration building, uh, to bring people into the front door of the building and give visitors a few parking spaces, as well as a plaza right in front of the building. And you'll see that in one of the upcoming renderings. To the campus side of the building, meaning that this building really has two entryways. There's the public entryway towards Villa Maria and Nash Street, as well as the campus entryway. Uh, that points back to the main Bryan campus. We have the main parking area, and you can see it's divided between staff parking spaces as well as visitor parking spaces. We have approximately 180 parking spaces to accommodate all the staff, 
uh, that will be a part of this building, as well as the students visiting and any community members that might want to visit the building. Another unique aspect and kind of a, a great thing we're trying to do for our prospective students, give them some dedicated bus parking so that when we get those larger groups from the high schools coming in, that they have dedicated parking for, for their buses. As we continue towards the south of this pro uh, property, uh, and based on some comments from a previous meeting, we have incorporated an intramural field. Uh, this is actually indicated in a future project of the master plan, so we're continuing to let that master plan evolve. We're looking at an intramural field, which will be just a graded grassed area uh, that we'll make available to the student services folks, and they can set up uh, flag football, ultimate frisbee, whatever kind of activities they, they want to, to work on there. Uh, and I will also highlight that even with the development of this intramural field, we still do have room to develop on Blinn's property, and that also is indicated in the master plan as a potential future building. And then as we continue on, uh, an, uh, an important aspect is this connectivity back to campus. You can see the Red River Drive there on the bottom of the screen. That is the existing roadway as well as those parking spaces at the bottom of the screen. That's, that's the existing parking area. We're going to tie this new development into the main part of campus, giving us another artery in and out of uh, in and out of campus. So we think that's going to be a great thing for our students. They'll have not only a drive, it's not quite shown there yet, the architects need to clean this up, but there will be a pedestrian walkway as well. Now delving into some of the renderings, uh, this is one of the first renderings. We'll have a series of about eight of these renderings I'll show you. This would be the view from Villa Maria looking across our circular drive. You can see that we have uh, the flag poles inside that circular drive in the landscaped area, uh, as well as the building in the back, and, and you can see Blinn's uh, tower that we like to put on our building. So we're, we're going to show you some really great images of that. One of the things the architects are trying to do with this building, most of the campuses, or most of the buildings here on the main part of campus look fairly similar. Uh, it's kind of a monochromatic architectural feature around campus. So they're trying to pull in some of the aspects of those buildings, but giving it a new character, giving it a bit of a wow factor. So we'll be looking at using some of the red brick, some of the cast stone elements, uh, while bringing in some, uh, some of the more modern uh, materials, some of the glass and the glazing, obviously the tower. Uh, but we're also bringing in some of the colonnade. A colonnade is a nice architectural feature here on the main part of campus, but they're updating that with that sleek steel colonnade feature you can see as we go around, and also giving some elements for graphics and marketing with some banners that hang off of those colonnades. Uh, the architects are also beginning to look at how lighting affects this, so you can see the lit tower at night uh, as a beacon to campus and giving it a real wow factor in the evening. We will be looking at color changing lights for that, similar to what we've done on some other towers. And then as you would continue along Nash Street, that public Nash Street before you get to the back of the building, this is a view of the circular drive entry. Uh, you can begin to get a feel of what it would be like to drive or, or ride your bike to campus and how you would get to the front side of this building. Uh, the architects are even beginning to look at wayfinding. That's going to be an important factor of this building because so many people coming to this building will be new. So we really want to do a good job with wayfinding and guiding, uh, guiding the visitors around this building. As you would get into the, the circular drive, uh, now we're looking at the plaza. So you can begin to see an area where visitors could be dropped off, some landscaping, some benches, uh, and the nice plaza aspect that you would have on the front of this building. Again, at night uh, from this view, you can see the lit tower and you can also see how the architects are looking to play with some lighting and really highlight this building. You can see the canopy that's going to give us a little bit of shade and a little bit of cover for rain as well. Now, moving to the campus side of, of the building, you can see our parking area and apparently we have a British driver on the wrong side of the road here. Um, you can see the view uh, of the main drive that brings you right into the, the, the campus side doors. There's going to be a drop off area on this side of the building as well, uh, so that maybe buses could come drop off their students and, and then go in their parking space. And again, the architects highlighting the lighting in this building in this two story lobby, this side of the building, and you'll see this in the plan shortly. Uh, this side of the lobby is a two story open space, very similar to what we have at uh, other other newer buildings. I'm going to jump into the floor plan, and I know that some of the, the specific rooms, the lettering on the specific rooms are small, but I'm going to give you the highlights of the major departments uh, as we go around. So starting off in the central part of this, this is the central lobby. So to kind of orient ourselves to the right of this is our circular drive. 
To the left of this is our staff and visitor parking area. So we have entryways from both kind of the, the public side and the campus side of this. Within the lobby, uh, we have access to the security desk and the police office so we can secure our lobby. This dashed line indicates the two-story space uh, and we will have a nice lobby stair within this, a nice architectural feature. Also very visible are our elevators and yet to be developed in the lobby are the furniture layouts, uh, kiosks for student services use, as well as any kind of graphics and wayfinding. So we'll work through those in subsequent design meetings. Moving to the north side of this plan, uh, we get into the financial aid and academic advising suite. This has about 24 offices for the various financial aid and academic advisors, uh, as well as a financial aid window that will open into the lobby for that triage that they need for quick access or for students to check in for their appointments. We also have a conferencing space in this area. Uh, and the white boxes to the top, just for reference, this is going to be a, an egress stair or a staff stair to get staff uh, up and down in the building as well as a freight elevator. And you'll notice that we're, this gets, uh, uh, gets uh, things moved up to the second floor uh, behind our meeting space. Continuing along on, on this wing of the building, we have our testing center. Uh, this will have a reception area with two reception stations, lockers for students to be able to store their belongings if they go into test. We'll also include two private testing rooms, the coordinator's office. It will have a third party testing room with 14 stations. Um, and it also has a large testing room with 24 testing stations. And then we have two restrooms so that students do not have to leave this space in the middle of the test if they need to use a restroom. Again, all of this floor, all of this first floor is just student services uh, functions here. And we've tried to move all of administration to the second floor. Continuing to the south wing of the plan, we have the prospective student relations right off of the lobby. So any new student groups coming in uh, can come into can see prospective student relations. This will have a reception area as well as several offices. Uh, of course, it will also have some work rooms and a storage room. They need storage for all of the different uh, things that they hand out to students. It will also have a reception desk uh, for their campus ambassadors. So tour groups or, or new students coming in will also have a reception for prospective student relations. Continuing along on this wing, we have our dual credit offices, which is a small reception area and a couple offices. We also have our enrollment, uh, our enrollment services department. This will have four stations at a counter. Uh, we'll also include a work area, two workstations, an office, and, uh, and a vault area. And I should have probably mentioned this earlier, uh, but it's kind of a back of house. Anything you see highlighted in gray is, is more of a service support area. So those could be mechanical rooms, electrical rooms, receiving areas. Of course, we have our main uh, restroom block centrally located in the building. But just as, a, as an idea of what the gray area is, I won't be highlighting them any further. Some of these yellow blocks include conference rooms, shared work rooms. The yellow areas are shared spaces. As we continue along uh, into more of the, the, the departmental areas, we have the transfer offices. Those are two, the two purple offices. Those are areas where our four-year partners could come in, uh, set up shop for the day, and help meet with blend students if they want to transfer to another four-year school. So just a pathway for us to help our students move on to another four-year school. And then the area in blue is our registrar's office. So this includes about five offices as well as four workstations in a common space. Moving up to our second floor, I'll start again in the, in the middle, start in the lobby. So this lobby, again, furniture will be further developed, but this lobby acts as a, another area where, where people can gather. Uh, up at the, you can see the open to below, so this will have a nice overlook down into the first floor lobby with the, the central lobby stair and the elevators getting you up to this lobby. It can also work as a pre-function space for our meeting area. Continuing along to the north side of this building, this is our, our meeting room. Again, the only dedicated meeting space that we would have here on the Bryan campus. And that could be used for community events. It could be used for blend events, uh, such as a Christmas party. It can also be used for our prospective students. So if the prospective students uh, have large groups coming in, they can schedule this room, have those large groups come in before they take them to campus tours. Uh, it's a little over 3,000 square foot space. We could have up to about 300 people in this room. And then we also have the associated uh, support services with storage and kitchenette. You can also see how it has access to the freight elevator uh, so that if we have catered events, that catering com company can bring their things uh, up and down through that freight elevator. Now for the administrative wing of the second floor, we have our business services office. So again, these, this is a group of folks who are moving from the Tejas Center. 
got several offices, a vault, and they'll have room for a small reception area. We also have our human resources wing, which also includes Title IX. There will be a reception area, conference space, uh, as well as several offices for the human resources personnel, the Title IX personnel, some secured storage in their own workroom. And then finishing off the suites on the second floor, we have our administrative area, again with a reception, several offices for legal, uh, as well as the executive dean's office, an office for the chancellor when she visits, and a conference space for meetings in that suite. Now to give the board an update on where we're at in the progress and looking forward, uh, it's, it's been an interesting time to proceed with this project. Uh, and so we are currently at the design stage, uh, January of 2023. How we envision moving forward is the architects have turned over their schematic design to the contractor and the contractor is putting together some, some estimates based on that to, to, to judge where we're at in, 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 in the budget. Um, we, we don't anticipate any issues. We've showed the designs to the contractor and he feels comfortable with the direction we're going. Uh, but the architects will be giving the contractor the GMP documents in March so that the contractor can get us a GMP price. That's the guaranteed maximum price for the project. We anticipate bringing that GMP price to the board in May of 2023. And if the board approves of that, we would anticipate breaking ground and starting construction in June of 2023. Now the next number is a little further out there. That is February of 2025. We are working to improve that, but right now the contractor is telling us due to some very long lead time items, such as electrical switch gear and chillers, that this is about a 17 month construction time frame. And then generally once the contractors are done with construction, it takes us a couple months to move in. We are working with the contractors to try and improve that. That is just the best information I have at this time. Uh, the current status again is we are at schematic design. Uh, the architects are increasing detail and the, the contractors are working through their estimates. Um, to remind the board of our budget, we are just under $31 million. $30.95 million is our total budget for the project, and that is unrestricted cash. There is no bonds, there is no borrowing on this project. This is all unrestricted cash. Um, so with that, uh, we're very excited about this project, very excited about how it's coming along, uh, and I will stand for any questions. Building looks awesome. Um, I'm curious on the uh, the amount of space on our existing uh, Bryan campus that's going to be transitioned to this new uh, building. How much how much space is currently being utilized on in our other buildings here that'll be transferred into this building? So Tejas is around twenty thousand square feet. So we're going to be moving everything from Tejas Center into this building. I do not have a good number from the square footage of administration and human resources in the S building. I, I don't have that breakout just yet on what that square footage yeah, is. Just so. curious about, you know, uh, what are we going to repurpose those spaces for after they all move into this building? Certainly, and that, that's, an, that's another step looking at how do we backfill once all those functions are moved. Obviously, Tejas Center is a lease space, and we would be looking to, to move out of that lease. and. I think, Mr. Cervantes, you might have information on that, but repurposing S building or repurposing maybe a suite in the A building is, is yet to be developed. Yes, thank you, Mark. We, we have already had discussions and we have an amendment to our existing contract at Tejas to take us out to February of 25. That group has been very uh, flexible with us. We've had uh, good discussions with them, and so if we have an issue where we're either have to move that up or move that back, I think they would probably be uh, receptive to it. Thank you. Another question I had in regards to the, um, the not the intramural fuel, but uh, the other large green space that looks like it's uh, gonna be for water retention. How, what can we be doing with that? Or is there anything can, that we can do for students? Because that's a large area. I mean, can that be a, frisbee golf or anything like that or just something that other than just green space i believe you're and i'm, I'm circling an area here i'm assuming you're talking Correct. this area so so there is a regional detention area here which we we are somewhat limited in what we can do there obviously we can't change the detention drastically um 
This area is a, is a nice wooded area. And one thing we need to consider there is the buffer between our campus and that residential community. So I think we would want to look at maintaining a level of a buffer, but there could be a level of development. And again, in the master plan, it does indicate some intramural type functions in that area. Mm -hmm. We don't quite have that developed yet. It, it's part of the master plan, but we certainly could look at, at putting something in that area. Uh, but I would want us to consider maintaining a level of a buffer between the residential community and our properties. I've got, I got several questions, probably going to wear you out on this. So following up on Mr. Cool course, at the Tejas building, how does the number of offices and the square footage that we had at Tejas compare to what's going into this new building? I, I don't have the exact number of, of square footage or, or, you know, generally our first floor here is 26,000 square feet. Our square footage at Tejas is around 20,000 square feet. So we're actually increasing their square footage. So we're going to have, uh, and more importantly, same number of offices. Are we looking at growth at all in any of those departments? Or we are trying to look for growth in some of these areas. There are some flex spaces that have been put into some of these, these departments that allow for, for some growth. Um, we're also right sizing some of the spaces based on the needs of the department. So it is it is slightly bigger, um, but we haven't really looked at this as in a um, take exactly what we have at Tejas and put it on campus. It was a reprogram. So we looked at the needs and the growth and how they're currently functioning because Tejas was designed maybe under different functionality. So while it's not a direct, you just kind of take what they have at Tejas and put it in this building. Well, we just need to make sure we account for growth and not not just limit ourselves on what we have now at yes, Tejas. So I want to make sure that. Can you go back to that first floor? And I'm, I'm going to talk about this quite a bit and apologize in advance. So our our enrollment services area that you have there in green, what that was originally designed for everywhere at Blend, not just here in Bryan and at Tejas, was the first stop that a student would make. That they would go there and that would be, then they would be sent off to financial aid or to advising or whatnot. The way you have it set up there, it's not going to be the first stop. You're going to have students walk into that front door and probably go to financial aid, probably go to prospective students because that's right there. Uh, you're going to need, in my opinion, to move that enrollment services somewhere more prominently to where that's going to be the people's first stop. Otherwise, you're going to need some type of information area right there in the middle because you're going to have people wondering, you know, where do I go? Where do I go? The other thing is, if you watch Tejas, Brenham, and, and in the old days when it was here, that's where your longest lines are going to be as well. I don't feel like you've got space right there to accommodate the lines and all that you could have there. So I really think you need to relook at your enrollment services area, the way you have it set up. Um, Certainly, yeah, we, we can we can talk with with leadership. And we can talk with the student services folks and talk with the architects and and, and take a look at how they plan to function that, uh, as as well as with some of the technology they're beginning to use for enrollment and check in, uh, as well as potential wayfinding opportunities in the in the building to help students get around the building. So certainly, we can we can we can take a look at that area, Dr. Krause. Okay, a couple of other questions. I'm again sorry to to beat a dead beat a lot of stuff here. You keep saying that's the only meeting room. What is this and what is that over there? It, it would be the only dedicated the meeting room. This, this room is really a multifunction space as well as with the, the theater department. Uh, but a room that would be dedicated for meetings, that, that would wind up being the only room on the, the Bryan campus of that size and nature dedicated for meetings. Okay, it seems like an awful big area for that when we have other needs that uh, that's just my opinion. Finally, I guess my last thing is, is there any kind of way that we're going to provide students to get from that building to here? Are we planning on any type of shuttle service or anything like that? And then I know we don't at Tejas now. And then that was when Tejas was initially built, we did, and it didn't, what it wasn't used. So, so it, you know, I don't know if that's really a moot point or not, but it just seems like if we had something to go between the buildings that may be helpful, maybe something to investigate. I think that could be an operational discussion. Uh, we could talk with that. Obviously, with this being a commuter campus, we do have a, a number of students that could drive back and forth, and we have ample parking there. 
Uh, but I think that the idea of a shuttle is an operational question that we could bring up to administration. No more questions. Anyone else have any thoughts or questions? Is the gray space next to the roller, tell me again, what is that? This area here, this is the, this is the bathroom block for the building. Okay. So these well, are the restrooms. <laughs> When you need it, yes, it is. I mean, to to uh, to Dennis's point, you know, I I it I could see the enrollment services potentially getting swapped with the prospective student relations, so that that's right at kind of the front door as you walk in. But I don't know how much space is needed for each one, but that would certainly give enrollment services a little more visibility. So, any other questions? All right, thanks, Mark. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to move on to the uh, consent item uh, portion of our agenda. Uh, all items listed in this portion of the agenda are considered to be routine by the Board of Trustees and will be enacted upon one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the trustees so request in which event the item will be removed from consent and considered in discussion and possible action. Trustees receive agenda materials in advance of the meeting to prepare for the business to be conducted. Uh, item A is approval of the minutes for December 13th, 2022. Regular meeting B, order of May 6, 2023, general election for the Blinn College Board of Trustees members representing precinct two and three to serve full six year terms. C is authorization for the administration to negotiate and execute all election services contract with Washington County for the May 6, 2023, general election of the Blinn College Board District Board of Trustees, uh, D, authorization for the administration to negotiate and execute agreements with local government entities for joint elections for the May 6, 2023, general election of the Blinn College District Board of Trustees, and E, the set the date, time, and place for drawing to determine order of candidates for the same position to appear on the ballot for the May 6, 2023, general election. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve those. I'll move. <clears throat> Mr. Mosier. Second. Second uh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Benke. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Motion passed. Um, now, number six discussion and possible action items. Uh, first item on that agenda is authorization for the administration to approve and award a policy for Blend College District's property insurance coverage. Mr. Savantes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hensley, members of the board. Uh, in su late September, the college issued an RFP for the district's property insurance coverage. Uh, the current policy that we have will expire at the end of this month. Uh, we tr traditionally have employed the service of an insurance consultant. Uh, he works very closely with our uh, Chris Beckendorf, uh, our representative. We've used that service for many years and have found it to be very helpful. Uh, he generally helps us in the evaluation of the response to the RP, but in this case, we had uh, only one bidder, the Texas Association of School Boards. Uh, we did have a number of companies that did uh, at least express an interest, but they did not sub submit a bid. In our summary of the bid, we considered two options. Option one is our recommendation. Uh, one thing that the board should know is the replacement cost values have gone up uh, for a couple of reasons. One is inflation, uh, but also because we've added a couple of new buildings. Uh, you may recall from an insurance perspective of uh, the issue that we had a couple of years ago, we were very fortunate that the deductible prior to the winter freeze had actually been adjusted uh, down from $100,000 to $25,000. That is no longer going to be the case. Uh, things have, have changed. Uh, and just as a side note, the college received uh, as reimbursement for the construction uh, and, the and the freeze that uh, impacted our facilities, six and a half million dollars. Uh, so the insurance companies really paid out and really helped us out. So the industry has changed, not just because of Blinn, but those sort of events happening throughout uh, uh, Southeast Texas. So they have changed their policy, not just for Blinn, for, but for others too. 
We currently have a, in the current year, we have a minimum and maximum deductible uh, for wind hail that has changed. That is no longer the case. We have an all weathers uh, peril deductible of half a million dollars. And again, that's for all schools that, that uh, participate with, with TASB. We also have included an other weather deductible, other than weather deductible. So if the freeze were to happen today, that would not go in that category, the 25,000, it would go into the half a million dollar category of the deductible. The insurance rates have increased by 9% and the amount that we are expecting to pay uh, this fiscal year would be, if the board approves this is $817,207. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation. I'll stand for any questions. Did I read that correctly, that you guys had budgeted uh, a uh, an insurance uh, premium that was more than what we Correct. received? We budgeted more than what we anticipated this expense would be, so we have more than enough in our budget uh, for for this this fiscal year. Any questions? I would entertain a motion to uh, that the Board of Trustees authorize the administration to award a policy for Blend College District's property insurance coverage to Dex Texas Association of School Boards Risk Management Fund. So moved. Mr. Mosier. Ms. Ehlert. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, yes, sir, members of the board. You. Okay, uh, we move now to item seven on our agenda, executive session. Uh, does appear that we're gonna go into exec executive session in accordance with 551.071 and 551.072. Uh, why don't we take a 10 minute break and uh, then we will go into executive sessions. It's 11.09 right now, so at 11.19. Oh, uh, just, uh, and I didn't know this, uh, Trustee Wells, but Trustee Wells couldn't be here in person today, but he's been on Zoom the entire time, so he, he's heard the entire thing. Thanks. We'll take a break right now. <laughs> 